Well, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to host this panel. And I'm very honored to be working with this group um, on this panel discussion. We're going to talk about mapping out the challenges and opportunities for clinical trials in Southeast Asia. So um, within each, oh, they didn't put them up, okay. So we do have about three bullet points we're going to touch off on. I'm going to kind of review those bullet points right now, then I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves. <coughs> each panelist will cover one of the bullet points, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. So today we're going to be talking about optimizing your clinical trial strategies for the changing environment and challenges in Southeast Asia. And what we want to touch upon is the engagement of key opinion leaders, the importance and benefits. We're also going to talk about growing your clinical trial trials in Southeast Asia with opportunities to increase trial efficiency. And by touching on understanding of clinical trial sites, standard of care, staffing and patient loads, recruitment rates, fast or slow. And then finally, modifying your clinical trial plan through understanding of Asian regulatory systems to maximize clinical trial progress. And with that, we're going to touch upon really regulations, fast track, um, et cetera. So with that, I'm going to start with to my left and Alvin and ask him to introduce himself. And then we'll go to Trang and to Paulius. So Alvin? Well, I just, I just talked. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we'll go with Trang. Trang, if you can introduce yourself. OK, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Trang Nguyen. I'm from Vietnam, and I um, Medical Affair, Clinical Operation Head of Sanofi Vietnam. I have been uh, um, controlling and managing clinical study and clinical trials in Vietnam for eight years. Excellent. And Paulus. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is uh, Paulus Vijanto. Actually, I'm uh, here as the replaced the uh, Ibu uh, Mrs. Rick Rick uh, Ilias. Uh, actually, I am a uh, general manager for the emerging uh, CRO in Indonesia, Pharma Metrics Lab, and we are working uh, a lot with uh, uh, Dr. Rick Rick Ilyas as the uh, as the one of the our sponsor. So I have been uh, through the ten years in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, almost eight years in the CRO business. Excellent. Thank you. So we're going to start with Alvin talking about optimizing your clinical trials, trial strategies and the, the importance and benefits of key opinion leaders. So Alvin, thank you. Well, I think I, I always touched upon earlier that leveraging the, the, the key opinion leaders uh, working on the, um, the approval process, uh, getting the, the contract and budget approval uh, is, is extremely important. I think this is completely different to the to the uh, the Western world. This is this part of the world is everything is based on relationship driven, and I think that's probably why I, I mentioned earlier too is all the all the system even in the in the uh, in the hospital or in the regulatory is it, all negotiable. Very good. Thank you. Um, any other comments on the panel in terms of the benefits of key opinion leaders? Yes, I think it's the the, the, the main thing and build the, the relationships as the, the, the is a capital uh, both uh, for both sides between the, the, the sponsor, even the CRO and the mm -hmm. key opinion leaders. Mm -hmm. And it's it is at your previous presentations that this could be lasting not only during the, 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 the yeah. clinical trials, but maybe during your existence in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in this uh, of this country yeah. in this area. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to just do one comment, Alvin. What do you think? And I'm not sure in your experience, but do you have local affiliates in every country helping with key opinion leaders? Or are you also leveraging either other alliances or CROs in terms of development of key opinion leaders in the Asia region? Our company do, is not that big. But yeah, we, do like have that. A, we do have a lot of good representatives mm -hmm. uh, of, of all different of the world and have local affiliates. But then the one we do not have, we actually using the CRO. Okay. Uh, so, but then again, I, I implement also the co-monitors, mm -hmm. as, as I said earlier too. Once this product is actually uh, submitted to the agency, 
the CIO will be gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's my turn to make sure that my company have a representative to the site and the key opinion leaders at that time. So hopefully during this study conduct, I actually can build a relationship with the KOL, with those countries that I don't have a representative in. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, that's good to, that's good to know. Um, going to the next um, bullet point we wanted to talk about, and um, Paulius, you're going to talk about this a little bit. Growing your clinical trial um, in Southeast Asia with opportunities to increase efficiency. I know we talked about really looking at it from the site perspective. What are some of the needs and what are some of the challenges that you see uh, in terms of that perspective? Yeah, so I think it's the, in the, uh, in the previous presentations, where is uh, some points is uh, very challenging and uh, could be very important. That you want to for uh, example is the understanding and learning about the local culture and local practice in this uh, region. I think it's quite important that uh, how to the, the the sponsor to interact with the sites and to uh, uh, determine which sites to, to do to, to, to perform the, the certain clinical trials. And also is the, also to, to, to develop a set uh, the, the, the interactive communications and relationship uh, uh, with, the, with the principal investigators networks is also is a pivotal. And I think also the 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 the, the new challenging is also that is using the what we call is local or emerging CRO, mm -hmm. then to, to to manage the because as uh, Alvin mentioned is the they know quite well the the, the, the local expertise and the, the the local habits, so sometimes you using the the, the local CRO, you can uh, also to accelerate the the, the process whatever is a regulatory or the site implementations but you can gaining also to 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 uh, to get all the uh, efficiency during the, the implementation of the study mm -hmm. so that is i think is a crucial because by my experience also that is a uh, local local cro emerging cro could be also this uh, the good uh, contributions in terms of quality and in terms of the efficiency to the to the to the conduct of the uh, even global clinical trials in this region. Okay. Uh, do you have sorry. any comments on that? I have yeah. just one point to add for yeah. the clinical uh, trial side is that um, as my point of view in Vietnam, we have very good like very good recruitment rate because we have a big uh, amount of patients, but like is is the first time and it is very new for the CEO in Vietnam in in Asian countries. So it is uh, necessary for the sponsor to to have very clear and transparent uh, communications between the CEO and the site at the beginning of the uh, of this trial, so that mm -hmm. they can communicate in the easily later. Mm -hmm. Very good. And Alvin, you you brought up a few good points earlier, and I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate on it a little more from a time perspective. But when we talk about the sites, and a lot of our global colleagues often think oh, we're going to save a lot of money to go to Asia. Mm -hmm. But when we pull in the quality component, or the sites have a lot of patients, what are your thoughts in terms of that perception that we want to ensure some of our global colleagues, but they do have either the expertise or what do we need to do to ensure that we're going to get the quality that we want? Well, I think the, the education, I think you're talking about the education yeah. back to the uh, US-based uh, yeah. organization. This is always a challenge because the unknown, because they always think that this is, this is part of the black hole. So I think, I think by, by implementing to ensure that the big data quality and the compliance and the trainings is in there, uh, the beginning of the site initiation with the correct setup and the, and the expectation with the CLO and and the sponsor expectation that you mentioned is also crucial. And then also understanding at the site level of the, their practice, the hospital practice, uh, as well as their, uh, their landscape of clinical trial. How, how well, uh, how often do they do a global clinical study? And how many studies can, do they have? 
I, we understand the patient's assessment is not an issue in this part of the world, mm -hmm. but if the question is can they conduct a study that the agency will accept. Mm -hmm. And I think those are all together that can explain to the, to, the, to the organization back and say, don't worry about this. I have all this measurement mm -hmm. that can ensure that we will get the filing, uh, a global filing later. And I think that's important to, to the organization. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Mm -hmm. Um, in the next bullet point, and we, we do have a lot of time, so we can elaborate on things. Um, so we may go back to some of the bullet points. So, um, Trang, you're going to cover a little bit about modifying your clinical trial plan in terms of understanding the Asian regulatory systems to ma maximize clinical trial progress. And certainly you can elaborate on anything in Vietnam if you yeah. can share with that. So as you all know, that the most important thing is the regulatory environment that is very like tricky in uh, Southeast Asia because all is still unclear, and maybe there's um there are, like some countries are mature than other countries in like the regulation system, but because uh, we are the improving world, so. They are all improving the clinical trials uh, regulation system. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, Vietnam before 2009, we don't have the GCP notion. But after, like, uh, we have uh, the study tour for, of the MOH to the France to study about the GCP. So after 2009, we apply the GCP system to all the clinical trials and for all investigators. And you know that we have just got the new circular that effected just yesterday. Wow. Yeah, it's your, so very brand new about the registration uh, study and also clinical trials. And it is, uh, and it, it is applicable that all the investigators that uh, participate in the trials to have to have GCP that is not needed before. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's quite a new um, idea and it is good uh, for the developing of the clinical trials in Vietnam. And also I think that of the timeline of the approval, I think that it is normally for most uh, Southeast Asia countries two or three months. But as Irene has just said that it is negotiable. Mm -hmm. If we have the good, uh, good relationship with the MOH, the health authorities, and also the hospital level, because we also have to pass the ethic committees and authorities in the hospital level as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I think that like um, many, like all Asian countries, Vietnam also need local data for registration mm -hmm. study and uh, we also accept uh, the Vietnam, Vietnam as a participating country in the global mm -hmm. uh, trials for some registrations. No, that's really good, excellent. You know, I just thought of a question, and it, and it goes back to um, Alvin's discussion, because I thought it was really intriguing, especially the, the, the twist in terms of the negotiations. And um, did you do that across all countries or just no. one country? I, I, I thought it was really interesting. I, I only do it for the, for the growth country that I have. We actually have a good relationship. Okay. I, again, you have to be dealing with relationship again. Okay. And then, and then if you look at, when you plan a global study, and for example, if I know I'm going to go to China, I'm actually going to start six months ahead. Yeah. Because I know that I have to file into the, the, the SFDA, and they're going to sit on some kind of shelf for four months anyway. So I can go in and do an application, and then later on I can go back and change it anyway. So, mm -hmm. so you have to understand the system, and then you know, okay, I'm going to play this gray area, as, as you mentioned, and then I can twist that. Yeah. Uh, but not all of them I would do it. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I think that, like Patricia has said, that we have to uh, mix and well cooperate between the expert, yeah. internal expert and uh, extra expert as well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes, because you bring up a really good point, Alvin, in that sometimes there's that, you know, they want to see it in black and white, but it says you have to do it this way. So they don't understand that you could actually start to think way ahead of time, put something in, there may be a few changes, 
but at least you've got your kind of, as they say, the ball rolling in a particular country like China that does have a really long timeline for review. Well, I think I think when you look back into a global company, yeah. they will look at and say, okay, this is the guideline from the authority, so it's black and white, and we think, wait a minute, this is an Asian culture here. Mm -hmm. Everything is relationship and everything is negotiable. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting that only recently, I have to say, that my experience that Yima and FDA start talking together. But in Asia, all of those authorities are talking to each other anyway. And they are way ahead, so they know what's going on. And so if you are negotiating, they will actually pick it up and they say, okay, what's going on? So I think, again, it, it's different, mm -hmm. and it's the mentality of the of the Western world who think everything is black and white. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. You know, I'm from the Western world. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in the gray area, though. Um, Me too. <laughs> Paul, yes, what what are your thoughts on some of the, the regulatory kind of the, how how we can modify any our clinical trial plans, or what are what are some of the things we can do ahead of time? Yes, I think is there is also that is the one opportunity also is mentioned is still there is a lot of gray area in terms of the regulatory in this area, but it's the, it is in the in the fact as Elvin said that they talk to each other, so there is the opportunity like the, the there is the, the there is the idea that is the ASEAN regulatory harmonization, and there is a, a long way to go because I heard that is the idea is since 2006 and this is not not yet. Uh, there is some steps to, to be harmonized, but the implementation is still going away. But at least they are talk, talking to each other and to the to the they they also they they learn what is the best practice in the regulatory for uh, the ASEAN members. And it's they only uh, there is some task force to be it's like task force or bioequivalence. They doing the guidelines for the common uh, countries in Asia. And I think it's in the in the future also is there is uh, they they try to to do the the task force is like the biosimilarity mm -hmm. in this area because it's coming to this area. So this is maybe the the opportunity also is the we gain the 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 the, the interest when we we know our uh, each of the country's local regulatory and also then we take the the leverage when they they talk to each other to get the, 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 the best practice in this uh, country to be as the, the, the model to the other uh, country mm -hmm. when they, they go into the ASEAN harmonization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and may I add the other comment too, all these different authorities in Asia Pacific here, they actually willing to accept and, 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 and ideas too. So mm -hmm. that's quite different than then the Yima guideline, you say this is the guideline. FDA is still negotiable, it's mm -hmm. interesting, but in, in this part of the world, they really want to, 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 to actually not negotiate, engage mm -hmm. with us. And then I think that that's a good, good sign. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think that they want to engage. I think it's also, you think of the learning, um, you know, the increase in the number of trials. They're, they're starting to gain their expertise and they want to, have those discussions. They they're there to learn, and we can certainly offer a lot to help um, scale them up. So I, I think it's really exciting. I think it's a really good point. Um, in terms of going back to looking at our when we're increasing or growing our clinical trials in Southeast Asia, and opportunities to increase trial efficiency, one of the things that is a common theme I think for many of us is there is certainly a different patient load. Doctors in Asia tend to have a, a lot more patients to see. Their staff are, are very, very busy. And I'm curious on um, the panel's experiences and what they've done to meet those challenges uh, um, in terms of getting your trials recruiting a lot faster, That's something that Alvin, you had touched on. So perhaps each of you can share something. Uh, some of the country are use the SMO, SMO model, mm -hmm. so they can actually help the site to actually uh, uh, getting the uh, documentation, SIV, and, and all the stuff going too. Uh, the other thing is we actually implement also during the contract negotiation because we already identified you have almost 15, 20 studies ongoing. Mm -hmm. How can you support it? Unlike most of the uh, European country or U U uh, US, 
the doctors actually dedicate to all the uh, nurse practitioners to do the job. Mm -hmm. But in this part of the world, it's not. The doctor is going to do the clinic, plus also doing clinical research. So during the negotiation, we already identified that's a risk, and then we actually implement into this uh, a resource. Mm -hmm. no, I think it's good. Okay. Um, so in Vietnam, we have the big problem with that because actually uh, most of the clinical trials happen in the key hospitals, which mm -hmm. which are very busy. And in key hospital, we have to collect the QL, which have uh, many many uh, patients as well. So uh, in our experiences, we provide uh, the resources to help the doctors with the documentation that Elvin has said. And also, we, uh, we, we, like, uh, we communicate with the KOL quite often, mm -hmm. more often than uh, the mm -hmm. guideline to help them with the SOP, because normally they don't remember the SOP, and sometimes the, 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 clinical, uh, the clinical doctors don't remember which study they are in. Sometimes mm -hmm. they misunderstand the protocol, so we have to remind them quite often. Mm -hmm. And um, also, uh, we provide also the external outsource resources mm -hmm. to help them, like the coordinators, uh, the mm -hmm. nurse, to help them with the, the archiving and the documentation as well. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. and, and also, we also have to provide the quite often the regular training okay. so that they keep remind of our study. Okay. Okay. And Paul, any comments from you on kind of some of the strategies in terms of high patient loads at sites and some of the things that you've seen or done to help these sites with their studies? Yes, I think it's also it's, it's mentioned also is your presentation previously is the mm -hmm. partnership model is also is uh, important in this area mm -hmm. because if you are doing uh, the approach the, the the sites and even also the, the subjects but especially if you are working with the principal investigator and since at the beginning you are uh, very clearly that you treat them as a partner in all the steps of the clinical trial implementations then I think is you have the more better commitments with uh, there as a partner. Mm -hmm. But as a partner, you are also that is a commitment from from you and also to provide them with the with the trainings, with the the, the coaching, in uh, in order to that they obtain the same qu uh, quality and uh, how to the to to fulfill all the required to to doing the the, the, the best practice and the, the the clinical trial management. So I think it's the all is related, and this uh, the partnership model is the I can I can share later on with a lot of a, a lot of success story with the, mm -hmm. this partnership model, mm -hmm. and this is also you can you can uh, build in a certain uh, uh, portfolio or certain networks in the short term, but it lasts long, mm -hmm. and you can implement it not only in what one, one portfolio. You work mm -hmm. in, in oncology, but if you have the partnership in sites especially, but in hospital, you can also the later on, you have the facility to enter when you bring with another trial. Mm -hmm. And that is the, 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 the I think it's also that to, to be adding value to, uh, to, to make that your, your project is uh, more efficient in this area. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to recap, um, so we do leave a little time for questions. Um, certainly, when we think about optimizing our clinical trial strategies, you know, it is really key to have a strong um, relationship with your investigators. The, these are the future of your product in the potential country, and, and it really is incredibly helpful and beneficial to have a key opinion leader that really understands you as a sponsor, understands the country, and helps drive recruitment at your sites. Um, certainly when you're growing your clinical trial efficiency in Southeast Asia in efficiencies, certainly opportunities to increase trial efficiency, you need to understand the environment, whether you have a presence in that country, whether you work with a CRO in that country or an SMO, but you want to have that expertise so that you can really drive your recruitment in your clinical trial and have a successful clinical trial. 
And certainly when we think about um, from a regulatory perspective, uh, you do want to have an understanding of the, the re regulatory framework. Having that key opinion leader or a strong CRO presence that helps you negotiate with that regulatory agency certainly helps you in, in getting your clinical trial through uh, and successful completion and approvals. So with that being said, we have about four minutes and 45 seconds for questions from the floor. Are there any questions? Um, I just would like to touch upon a strange term. I would like to call it cross-cultural sensitivity. This is related to the understanding of clinical trial science. The first one is the sophisticated information for the subjects. Sometimes the, con the uh, information may come up to 15 pages and it is quite quite complicated for people in developing country to understand it as the chairman of the ethics committee i would say this creates a problem so we have to find a way out how we can overcome the problem without applying double standards that is the first issue and the other one is um, our sponsors or the companies that create the uh, protocol should also understand that their culture, even though the ethical value is the same between countries, there are sometimes difference, small difference between culture. For example, in the fasting months, in a country like Indonesia, fasting month, most of the Indonesian people are Muslims. You will find out that the rate of recruitment, subject recruitment, declines dramatically. Or sometimes, if the patient still takes the drug, the pharmacokinetics of the drug may differ markedly. The other things, probably in other countries, is not a problem, but porcine containing drugs may create a serious problem. Okay? And the other thing is the process as deci in decision making for a lady subject, female subjects. In Western country, the subject can decide whatever she wants, whether to say yes or no. But in developing country, no, in, in Muslim countries like Indonesia, quite often, even the subjects want to say yes or no, she will ask one or two days uh, to get sufficient, sufficient time to have a consultation permission from the husband. That is what I mean with cross-cultural sensitivity. Thank you. I think you bring up an excellent point, and I want you to know it's not just in developing countries. Even a country as large as the United States, where it is a very diverse country across multiple religions, multiple ethnic groups, it's the exact same problem. There was research a few years ago regarding oncology studies and informed consent forms, and about six months after the study started, um, volunteers went and asked the patients, could they tell them about this study? It's like a 35-page informed consent form. The research patients had no idea what they signed. So you bring up a really valuable point. I think as we are developing, it's why I mentioned earlier, the complexity of clinical studies. And we do have to consider, um, in, the, in, in Asia, we have many, many different people that we're working with many different religions, many different cultures, and we have to take that into context. You can't take necessarily a protocol developed in New York City and think you can do this around the world. And I think what we had discussed earlier today, but I am really keen to hear from the panelists, is when you think about why we want to engage key opinion leaders or we want to engage in that country, give us feedback on this before we go and submit it to the regulatory authority, before we go to submit it to ethics committees. Patients, sometimes they should be able to take a consent form home. They have to consult their entire family, um, not just a, a possibly a woman consulting her husband, but maybe it's, a, it's an elderly parent and all the children want to be involved in that decision. 
So we have to consider that. So we may set very aggressive timelines, but we do certainly have to understand. Remember, we are all in this to bring new medicines to market, and patients need to be safe when they're participating in trials. So I think we need to be very cognizant of those cultural differences, and you bring up an excellent point. I guess I'll start with Alvin and go this way for oh, comments. I could go on and on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fully appreciate for the cross-cultural differences here, and I, I think that I want to say that there's no one protocol fit all. And so I usually apply for country specific protocol as well to implement into my global protocol. Uh, I agree with you, Muslim is actually also in the United States, particularly in Indianapolis. It's huge there too. And then I could also say that there's a lot of uh, uh, um, Latin America actually sitting right in Southern California too. So we also have to apply all of those uh, when we're going to work in a study. Mm -hmm. In terms of informed consent, this is always an issue, not only in this part of the world, but also in the U.S. What Do we have an adequate informed consent process? And the FDA keep asking for it. So in this part of the world, it's taking even longer. You cannot just give a patient an ICF and then ask them to sign it today and then do the blood draw. Yeah. They do, they might say, yes, I'm going to, I, I, think, I, I think I'm going to do this. But what happened is, doesn't matter if it's a female or a, a, a children uh -huh. or a child, it, they actually will bring it back home. The whole family will actually make decision for them too. So it's part of the culture, doesn't matter. So you have to just really wait. And then in, in terms of the process, what I add on is to ask the patient to come back with questions yep. before that and we document the questions because that's what the FDA is looking for. How would you know that the patient understands? And we can provide that. He said, this patient took the ICF at home, and this is the amount of time came back, mm -hmm. and he came and asked all these questions. And these are the answer from the, from the, from the site. So that actually proven to be actually more successful. Trang, any comments yeah. from you? Um, I agree on, oh, totally agree with Patricia and uh, Alvin, because uh, in our experiences, because in Vietnam country, uh, we also have that culture is that like, for example, of the female, they can't make up their mind uh, by themselves. They have to consult their family, especially their husband. So when we give the informed consent, uh, we have to give them the time to think of it and then return. And also some of them uh, turn off with many questions regarding the benefits and also the ways that they have to participate in the study. And so that that is exactly the case that we have. And regarding the, the thing that you said about the ICF that have 30 pages, 35 pages. Um, so uh, um, I mean, it's always right that like uh, we must have protocol and ICF specific for country because uh, like for the global um, trials, we have the, uh, the, 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 the frame of the protocol and ICF, but for country, we can adapt it, um, adapt it them according to country and for the regulations of the country as well. And Paul, you have any comments from you? Well, I agree? I yeah. No, it's a really good question. I think also when you're thinking about your development strategy, you bring up another good point. In any Muslim country, the compound cannot contain any pork kind yeah. ingredient. So I think, as I had mentioned earlier, you want to think very early. And, and, I, and I've worked with groups, you know, they just say, okay, you know, it's phase three, we're going to give it to Asia now. Wait a minute. What went on phase one, phase two? We need to think much, much earlier so that when we are coming to Asia or when we're developing from Asia and going elsewhere, really have a strategy in place so that you understand what the needs are in a very, very large and very, very diverse area. So a very good question. Do we have time for any other questions or are we? Any other questions? <laughs>